Afternoon coaches, welcome to the Daily Sports Locker Room Podcast. Uh, Dan and Ryan are back with this week, Dan St. Ledger, Ryan Jones, lads, very welcome again. That's a quiet weekend on the football front, but still plenty to talk about. Um, you know, we, we, we'll probably start with the Munster final, uh, Claire and Kerry, uh, a, a not 23 to 113 win. <clears throat> probably, you know, Kerry were always going to win the game, lads. Uh, but I suppose, you know, from, from Claire's perspective, there'll be a huge amount of positives. Daniel, I know you've been a big fan of Claire. Uh, I know you. I know you have you have good connections with with David Tuberty as well. You would have followed Claire's progress. I remember actually Daniel at the time chatting to you whenever um, Carlo being promoted that time, and you were sort of saying that Claire did something very similar. You know, they got up, and then the following year they got up, and then they established themselves, and you know they became that sort of you know real consistent, durable Division Two team. And and the achievement of Colin Collins in in keeping Claire where they were at probably was no mean feat, but they did have some exceptional players. But for the players they've lost this year, Ledge. And for them to produce, you know, the performances that they produced, just narrowly missed out in promotion, went to the last day in Nuri, uh, albeit down won that game. But to come out then and and obviously, you know, put up a really credible performance against Kerry. And that's not us being patronising, like, but it, it shows you that there is football there. There's there's something there in Clare Daniel for a county as well, too, that is such that is such strong hurling links as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and like well, West Clare where I would have grown up, like it is all football. I mean, there is there is no hurling. It is only football, and it's. I mean, it's it's wild football country, you know. And, and probably, you know, you you traditionally a lot of a lot of player teams would have only been West Clare nearly. And, and I think one of the things that Colin Collins did really well was kind of integrating East Clare, North Clare, bringing in kind of some of the hurlers who who not hurlers, but let's say hurling clubs traditionally, and getting them integrated a little bit more. I think was was a massive win. But I I probably to be to be fair, like I kind of would com- compare this with. You know, when Pat Gilroy came into Dublin and he culture shocked the life out of Dublin football. I think Colin Collins did that with Clare and left an incredible legacy. But I think this current crop is such a new group. I think Mark Fitzgerald deserves massive credit because you yeah, know what? I, I thought I thought on Sunday, I thought on Sunday they put the, uh, a brilliant display of we talked about with, with Loud in Dublin last week, what we'd like to see from Loud. I thought Clare had the balance of being really defensively set. They had Clarity around their their kickout strategy. Yes, it was long. It was Sean Patton S Donny Gall down the middle. But mm-hmm. obviously they said to themselves, let's get it out there. Worst case scenario, we have 13 men behind the ball. If we don't win it, if we yeah. win it, we're, we're on the counter-attack. And, um, and Leds, Leds the, the good matchups as well. Like, the lad of Guru who 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 put in a, a monster of a performance against uh, Paddy Clever as well. And on the front foot too, I was laughing because I seen a wee, I seen a wee uh, interview from him. And he was talking about his friends and Clare, and he was talking about how Clare people, as you say, in West Clare would call the townie soft, and he plays yeah. for a town club. I don't think I'd be calling that boy soft, like because he's he's a hardy boy, like and he's a strong he's a strong lad. But he, he was he was he had a phenomenal game on 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 Sunday, along with Dermot Coughlin, obviously at centre half forward. Who I know Ryan, you you're going to chat about it in a, in a bit, like but but let's like you know they had so many aspects of their game really really well nailed, like even the matchups, like I thought were were, were very impressive, like. Yeah, they, they, they really were. It's impressive. And in fairness, like, Paddy Clifford, I still think, was pivotal in the whole game. But I, I thought Aguero actually did quite well, all things considered. And I was, I just texted David Tuberty at halftime. We were just chatting very briefly about it. And he said, you would love to be an inside forward with Paddy Clifford playing outside. Like, I mean, he's a ray of passing. I mean, there, there's only so much you can do in a matchup sometimes. He's just, he is top class. But that's probably a conversation for later. But just back to Claire. And I, I, I think this is all about Claire, really, because you can't, look, you can't read too much into to Kerry. But, I, I just thought they were they were so efficient about what they did and there were it's such a good template for other teams that when you are playing that underdog role, if you can get the balance right, even some small things there from free kicks to a couple of free kicks they put Bohannon inside in a one on one and they put long direct ball into him a couple of times. Like that's clearly a plan that they've thought about that they've worked. Just something different to try and see could they expose something. You know, there was actually thought behind how they played and, and that's what really impressed me about them. There was a clarity of their, a clarity in their play, a clarity in their coaching, and and as you said, like some really nice footballers, Emma McMahon, Emma McMahon, Coughlin, like these lads are these lads are really good, really good footballers, and and um, in fairness, they managed to keep managed to keep Clifford relatively quiet, all things considered as well. Sean, you say probably a different story, but for the most part, I was I was rightly impressed with Claire, and probably the the work on for them now is being able to repeat that kind of effort for let's say the next six weeks when they're playing three big games in Sam Maguire and that that may be where it will be where it'll come unstuck a little bit but invaluable for a young team you know yeah and Ryan you obviously texted Sunday there just sort of saying that 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 performance from Clare should give 
you know, the, the, the smaller counties, and we need to be careful what we, how we word it, like when we say smaller counties, but the counties were probably with less resources and less sort of, you, you know, um, what's the right word to use here, even even the financial clout that some of the bigger counties have, like, and it should give them real confidence, Ryan, with, 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 a, with a well-executed plan, clear structure, and, and a well-conditioned team, you know? Definitely, Stephen. Like, let's face it, lads, the amount of players I think Claire are missing was a 12 of the 20 that featured in last year's Munster final, I thought I heard the reporter saying. So to be missing that amount of players, and they were competitive right up. You know, we were probably thinking the dull mile here to get to half time. It looked like Kerry were going to stretch it out. And again, they responded. So massive credit to Clare. Obviously, it's a massive hurling county too. So mm. for them to be able to produce that level of performance, the buy-in from the players, I actually thought their conditional levels were very impressive. There was maybe a few guys that, yeah, they're probably young. It's the first time maybe on the county squad, even the guy, you can't remember his name, that picked up David Clifford. But here, the way that they had the likes of Coughlin, McMahon, Griffin, Downs, I thought them boys were, um, you know, they really showed what, they, what they're about. And if Clare could potentially get some of them other players back next year, I'm thinking of Keelan Sexton, the big guy who used to play in the middle of the pitch for them, um, O'Connor, I think is his name. Yeah. If they could get some of that squad back, boys, Clare are, they're a savage team. And um, massive credit to them, again, if you are a so-called lesser county, I think you could take a lot away from what Clare are about there. As Dan said, they had a clear structure, they had a clear game plan. When it came to attacking, they weren't afraid to be brave. But a few times, even one time, Cochran cut through three or four men. You're probably saying, tap it over the bar. But they yeah. were very, he went for goal, it didn't come off. Start of the second half, they had a goal chance again. Another team maybe tried to fist the ball over the bar, keep the scoreboard ticking. I thought Clare were right to be brave. It didn't come off for them. But look, massive credit to them. And if they could push on in the All Ireland series, it'll be a, it'll be a story of the year, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah, it certainly would. And Daniel, as, as good as Clare were, Kerry were quite underwhelming. Um, you know, I know obviously we know we know the usual suspects, the Cliffords, you know, Shawnee O'Shea, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, defensively, there's big question marks there, Ledge. You know, Ryan even talked about how easy Clare got in and opportunities for, for goal. Paddy Talley was brought into to Kerry, obviously, to really, really you know, set up a real strong defensive structure and, and, and platform, which which he did, which he did. And I think in his first season, I don't think they conceded a goal in the whole of the championship, if I'm if I'm led to believe the correct like, but I just feel like there, you know, there's there's big question marks over over the K defense. I know Taj Morley on Sunday sort of played nearly as a as, as a sort of a floating defender, nearly as a plus one at times, you know, at different times in the game. But you know, you, you would be just a little concerned about about Kerry. It's it's similar similar problems. It's a recurring theme. Like I mean, any any time Clare got runners uh, going in numbers at the carry defence, that they were in scramble mode. You know, and like the two goals are perfect examples. I agree with Ryan. Actually, I I think Clare were dead right to go for those. You know, I mean, the talk about being brave, like having lashed them. I thought I thought it was I thought it was kind of symbolic of the way they played the whole game. But um, Kerry really struggled with runners. I I think if Kerry if if a team tried to play it uh, more directly. And kind of kick pass and 50, 60 meter kick pass. And I think Kerry be okay. I think they struggle really badly when a team withdraws and runs at them. Um, even the fact that Jason Foley was kind of streamlined straight back in will kind of suggest, again, this is just from the outside, but would kind of suggest that there's a couple of problem issues there in, in Kerry's defense that without their main six, they're a little bit nervous about. Um, I, 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 I look, it's very hard to know. I mean, as Jack O'Connor said afterwards, the championship starts now. Um, that, Kind of sums up probably where they are. Maybe they have something under their under the hood that they're not releasing, but I don't think so because it's kind of been a re- repetitive theme with Kerry. Um, now listen, what the, the the same caveat as always is they're going to get through the group like they have. Um, they'll probably have Loud, they'll have Monaghan, they'll have Mead. That's a lovely group to kind of hone in a couple of uh, you know a couple of performances without having to exert themselves too much. And look, Kerry are always capable of a one-off kind of a performance, you know, and, and look, ultimately, I think they'll still be semi-final territory, minimum probably, but I would not set in the world light at the moment. Mm-hmm. Kerry sort of tend to come alive, Ryan, when they get to Crow Park as well, you know, they they produced a real good performance against Dublin in the, in the National League this year in, in, in Crow Park, but like, you're, you're sort of looking, you're sort of looking, Ryan, at, at the Kerry team and you're sort of thinking to yourself, you know, it's this this All Ireland series, right? This All Ireland series. You're playing you're playing three games for one team to get eliminated. You know what? They're gonna qualify, right? Let's be honest. They're gonna qualify. They're gonna go through. They're gonna be in the last eight, as Led said, probably the last four. Like, and it is a distinctly unfair advantage, like that they come through the provincial structure like that. And 
you know, they have the, the luxury, Ryan, as you would say, of, of nearly tapering and tailoring their training to like peak for, for a certain time of the year when other counties don't. I know, I know Dorney talked about, you know, Derry, you know, Mickey Hart master plan would be to lose to Donegal and allow them, you know, the opportunity to build. I don't think that would have been the plan, but it might, it'll be interesting to see if Derry, if Derry are, you know, in better shape than, than some of the teams that have gone the distance in Ulster. Yeah, well, the Kerry thing, it definitely, you know, it's they're in a great place where they can look ahead and say, look, we're going to probably coast through this group. You know, no disrespect to Monaghan, Meath and Louth. On the other side of it, what I would say, even for myself as a player, you still like to get tested in a championship campaign. And up until now, we're giving Clare massive credit. But let's face it, Clare aren't going to be the same calibre team that Kerry are going to face in All-Ireland semi-final. So yeah. what I would say is Monaghan... Again, we're relegated this year. Meath and Louth were two Division Two teams. Carry a massive advantage, but if they don't get tested in the in the group stage, they could potentially come into an All Ireland semi final cold. And mm-hmm. the thing about Derry is losing to Donegal. They're able to now identify things that maybe didn't work out for them that could have potentially caught them out further down the line anyway. So that's one we'll be afraid of. Carry is that they're not going to be tested. They come into an All Ireland semi final cold. Now, again, we have mentioned this numerous times. If you stop Paddy Clifford and David Clifford, you're you're knocking Kerry big time. And at the weekend, that guy Aguero done a done a very good job on Paddy Clifford. Paddy still showed his moments, got a few points, but I wouldn't say he was running the game the way he has previously for Kerry. And I thought David, what did he score? Maybe three or four from play. Again, that's you know, if you're looking at it, you would say that that's good going from any full forward. But mm. what I'm trying to say is, if you can in, take away the influence that David and Paddy Clifford have. Clare even were competitive with them. So I think that's Kerry's biggest issue is if teams are able to identify those two lads, get matchups accordingly, then have they enough throughout the throughout the pitch to um to win big games and all there in semi final or final. Interesting stat there, lads, too, has emerged on Twitter from so it's like the, the average winning margin in, in Killarney, Daniel, between the two teams was was nearly over thirteen points. The average winning margin in Ennis between the two teams is only over five. You know, and you sort of think to yourself as well, like Kerry, and 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 maybe you can you can definitely draw Dublin in this as well. If you were to take them out of their familiar environment and get them to these more smaller provincial venues, because it was a great atmosphere there on Sunday Ledge as well, like it definitely makes for a better championship. Like, you know, and and take it out of like a soulless crow park, which is going to be empty, or you know, it, it just it makes sense, doesn't it? Like. Definitely, yeah. and look, we're we're not we're not saying that like Kerry or Dublin are going to start losing monster finals over this, but it makes them competitive at least, you know. And like I I, I thought I thought Cusy Park and Sunday had a and but in fairness and Salt Hill as well, they had real championship fields. Do you know what I mean? That you were yeah. thinking to yourself, geez, that love to be over there, in sunshine, and you having a few points before the game. It actually felt real. Whereas like you go back to the double header in Crow Park last week, it mm. just it felt so disconnected from what the whole GA thing is about like do you know what I mean and I, and I think maybe that's why you know Munster Hurling gets an awful uh, lot of praise in, in a lot of circles because it's it's yeah. all in, it's in those provincial grounds and it's it's you know it's a kind of emblem of summertime whereas I, I, and as you say a half empty Croke Park is an emblem of, like it's it's nothing do you know what I mean but um, yeah. there is something I think there definitely is something in that and it there's no doubt about it like as a, as a home as, as, as a player playing at home like even when Kerry were getting away a little bit and there was 10 or 15 minutes left Player were still able to fight to, to draw on something. Whereas if that was down to Clarny, there's fewer Clare people there. Maybe you don't get that little bit of extra energy that you might need. And look, as I said, we're not saying that it's going to be the difference between winning and losing, but it makes for a better it makes for a better occasion. You know, look, Kerry and Dublin don't care about occasions; they want medals. Fair enough. Yeah. But I, I think there has to be I, I think there has to be a kind of something definitely with Leinster anyway. I think the rest of it's not too bad, but definitely with Leinster. I've seen that Ryan next this morning, a journalist in Louth calling for Louth to make sure that their home game was in RD, you know, where they've played a lot of National League games. I was in RD a few years ago at a National League game that played Derry last year, actually. Played Derry in Division Two. And you know, it was a great wee venue, lovely venue. You know, it was it was tight, it was a great atmosphere, place was packed. You know, and I think it'd be mad to like take a game like that to Navin where you're just looking at a big empty terrace, you're looking at both ends, both ends behind the goals empty, and you know, it doesn't have that same level of atmosphere. And I think that even I've even said this, Ryan, at, at local level, you know, I think a lot of championship games now and down, for example, right, are played in Park Astor, and there's maybe a thousand people at it. 
but the stand's empty, there's no atmosphere, there's echoes, you can hear the like, But if you took that to a small club ground and it's tight and it's compact and a thousand people all of a sudden look, you know, as if there's the place is full, Tyrone do it in their club championship round. And I definitely feel a venue plays a role in atmosphere and intensity of the game. There is absolutely no doubt about it. And even from a player's point of view, I would probably rather play in a nice venue where it's it's compact and it feels like there's there's a massive support there and the crowd are getting involved than maybe going and playing, as you mentioned, their Crow Park, where it's half empty. Um, players want to play under an atmosphere, you know, where the crowd's getting involved. And look, Larry v Dublin, I would seriously consider going to that vinyl if it was anywhere else but Crow Park. It's just a, you know, looking on from the outside, it's in Croker, it's probably going to be half full. Though Dublin's going to, you know, probably cruise through the game. But if you took that game to Navan or I don't know where else in Leinster that maybe can hold 20,000. Yeah. Yeah, as a neutral, I'd be saying it'd be a great day. You know, yeah. for starters, Dublin are out of Crow Park. It makes it a wee bit more even already. We've already talked in that Claire Carey room. So I think they definitely could look at things they got and try and create more of an occasion rather than just saying, that's the venue where it always has been and we're going to stick with that. Think outside the box and how can we create more of an atmosphere for the players playing, but also for the supporters. Yeah, and even yourself, Ryan, last year with, with Fermanagh, you know, a lot of league games in, in Erdney, and I think that had a big impact in your promotion as well. You know, you even the yeah, game against yeah. Dublin, you know, and the, the atmosphere and, and, and the, the, the tightness of the pitch, whereas Brewster maybe is a bit more a bit more yeah. open, isn't it? Like, you know. Uh, but lads, moving on to Galway and, and Mayo, Patrick Joyce didn't mince his words after the game. I know he's a bit disappointed with some of the criticism Connor Gleeson received. I, I probably haven't really been Gleeson's biggest fan myself over the last number of years. I know... Uh, uh, condolences to him. I think he, he he had a funeral on Tuesday. His grandmother, Lord Rester, passed away. I think um I, I think Podrick made reference to that. But 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 he stepped up to the mark, Daniel, this week. He really did step up to the mark. He kicked an unbelievable free to to win the game later on. Uh, we'll, we'll chat about the free and and the referee in a second. But for me, it, it's hard to know, Daniel, where either of these two teams are. I, I don't know if either of them are real serious contenders. Galway, you know, probably for me have flattered to deceive a little bit this year, but probably. A bit more green shoots for Galway with Comer back in the team. Rod Finnerty firing again. Eight points, great return. Takes the heat off off Walsh, of course, as well. And then Walsh only coming off the bench. There's probably an element of, of of mental and physical fatigue with Shane as well, Daniel, with the amount of football he's played over the last last year. But where do you see Galway in in, in this in this uh, contest? Um, before the game, I was thinking, Jesus, Park Joyce would be over the moon here if he got his majority of his panel game time. Firstly if he was competitive and if it gave them, as you say, a couple of green shoots going into going into the Sam Maguire series. I, I'm i not sure. Look, I know there was like, the reaction afterwards, I think, told an awful lot. I think there's an element of surprise in Galway. Like, I mean, they, they, most of the, like, the majority of that team had very little time under the belt in the league. I mean, yeah. they shouldn't have been, they should not have been competing really with Mayo. And Mayo, like, very clearly have stated league we're preparing all about Connacht and all the rest of it like I was so disappointed with Mayo again to be honest with you it was the same performance as it was in, in Roscommon they're they're just they're they're lacking so much personality and in fairness to the Sunday game they, I know we criticise it probably a lot but I thought the analysis was really good the Sunday game uh, the, the other night afterward on the evening show and they highlighted about, about Mayo's one-to-one stuff and yes you get the odd turnover here and there but like I, I thought Galway were septic in the first half. I thought her handling was poor, kick pass was poor, decision making was poor. But because uh, Mayo insisted on this kind of high sort of a press, they left McBreen one on one with Comer and they left Finnerty exactly. inside kind of with <laughs> the Jack Lyon sometimes and kind of McHugh in and out. But that kept Galway in it because all Galway had to do was right twelve behind, thirteen behind the ball, hit him with a couple of counter attacks. Away we go. Like Mayo lack a real bit of finesse. They like even in the middle third, you know, years ago their 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 middle third would have bailed them out. So your your Boyles, your Keegan's, you know, getting up the field, Paddy Durkins getting up the field, getting scores. Whereas like Mayo's middle third at the moment, like Ryan yes, picked a nice couple of points, but there's no cr- creativity in that middle third. There's no like I mean in fairness, Ryan Dunn who's a lovely footballer, Tommy Conway, really good footballer, but they never seem to get an opportunity where they're, they're getting early ball delivered into them or, or they're playing with any kind of um, a pattern. And it, it's it's like you look at like Cohen, for example, they show Cohen running in three or four times to occupy a sweeper. 
and mm. really good, like really good in theory, absolutely. But then he he's purely doing it because he was told to do it, rather than doing it to think I can actually win a ball here and, and turn it yeah. on the score. And you saw Daly a couple of times just saying, well, he's clearly doing nothing and going back to his sweeping role. It was really good analysis at all from Sunday game, but it just it, that just sums up Mayo for me. I, there's just a lack of real football in kind of creativity amongst an awful lot of them, and it's I I I don't think I don't think they're going anywhere to be honest. Lack of identity, lack of direction, Ryan. Would you would you agree with Ed's or about Mayo? <clears throat> well, I would. Um, I suppose the worrying thing from a Mayo point of view is if you compare that to those to final the week before and how mm. long it took for Donny Gold to maybe engineer that last score where Ryan McKee yeah. took it and it dropped short. That was going into the final stages, and then once Donny Gold got ahead in extra time, how they were able to take control of the game and just hold on to the ball for the last two or three minutes. Now I know Tyrone were out on their feet at that stage. But the worrying thing for me about Mayo is how easy Galway, once it came down to that final stages of the game, how easy Galway could just pick off two and three scores literally in a couple of minutes. Mm. And I'm not saying that was down to brilliant Galway play. I think it's just Mayo are confused whether they want to play a high press game or whether they want to get bottled back and in the finish they're kind of caught between both and they probably don't do either very well. Mm. Um, so I think Mayo are they are what they are. I don't think anyone at the start of the year would have seen them as all Ireland contenders. You know, they're still relying on Killian O'Connor to come on and try and, you know, kick a couple of wonder scores for them. Um I think that, you know, Ian O'Shea seems to always be taken off once they hit 55, 60 minutes, regardless of yeah. how the game's going. That that's kind of a, a change they have already made in their head. Um and look, Galway, as good as it was to get all those players back, they weren't near match fit. Um Shane Walsh probably only had a half an hour in him. Uh, Comer was outstanding, but again, you could see he was probably lacking mark, match sharpness as well. Mm-hmm. Coming into the final 15, 20 minutes, I thought you could you could tell by watching on that he was out in his feet. Um, so, Gawley will be delighted, but I'm just not too sure if they have enough time to get them players up to the level that's required, you know, to really, really compete all Ireland semi-final stage. Um, so, that'll be my worry from a Gawley point of view as well, but... Look, it was a good final in, in that both teams went at it towards the end and you didn't know what way it was going to go, but I think both teams are still, they're lacking a bit to be competing at the top table further down the line. And, and Cahill Sweeney got hooked, Daniel, just about two minutes before half time, and, you know, for Shane Walsh, and you're sort of thinking to yourself, like, the timing of substitutions is huge too, isn't it? Like, if you wait for another 90 seconds or whatever, you go into the change rooms, he comes off at half time, doesn't feel as humiliating, doesn't feel as bad. Like, but when you're getting hooked at a big championship game like that before half time, there's there's something about it, isn't there? Like, and even even from a player's confidence point of view, like, you know, no Ryan talked about, you know, Ian O'Shea probably getting the hook after 50, 55 minutes, like, probably knows at that stage, maybe he's flagging a little bit. Like, but when you're getting the hook after 30, 32 minutes, it's, it's demoralizing for a player, like, demoralizing. Yeah, it definitely is, and and like I I don't know what the what the gain is really. I mean, maybe maybe it's to kind of send a bit of a, a lightning bolt into his team to to show a bit of cutthroat nature or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, like what benefit what benefit it was really that that sub could have been made at half time. It, it is humiliating for a player. And look, you're it's a bit of revisionism as well when you win. It's kind of it's it's all good and and calls me to forget about that by the end of it. But if you lose, you're making a big rod for your back, and it just I don't know I I, I don't think there's necessity for it. Um, like three minutes was not going to make a difference either way. So I look I I, I don't know I'm not I'm not it wouldn't personally be the way I do things. Like maybe maybe there's something behind it. Maybe there's an Akuno. I'm not sure, but um. Yeah, look, you, you could see he was probably like dropping walls was a big decision initially, and he was probably like. Carl Sweeney was probably then under that little bit of pressure that it was almost the second he does does anything wrong, it was almost right watch is getting in, you know. So maybe there's an element to that. But um I, I, I still think I still think I I kind of agree with Ryan that like time is limited for them now. But you're looking at the group they're probably going to have. I even feeling kind of it could be your Derry Westmead, possibly Arma, I think. I I think I think all we won't be a won't be a million miles away. And just the reason being is because I, I think they have I, th- I think they kind of found a little bit of identity at the weekend. Um, they got back to a little bit of that kind of solid defensive work. Um, I thought, sorry to pass over. Um, I thought that like Comer, Finnerty, was that that trifecta, like that's got damage in it. Like, you know, you've got Finnerty who's kind of... Absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. You've got you've got you've got that nice sorry I lost there. You've got that nice balance, I think, of 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 forwards, and then you you throw in Tierney, Conroy, 
Like they, they have John Maher, even a lot of energy. They have they have some good tools. It's just a matter of what what way that group leaves them, you know. And and maybe maybe the injuries could be worse after the weekend than they were than than they were beforehand. I don't know, but if if they get everyone back in the field, they they'll be able to squeak for for semi final stage. I say. Yeah, no, no. I think you lost me there, Ledge, just when you were chatting there. But um, certainly, certainly, Finnerty, Comer, and, and Walsh is a full forward line that would have a lot of defences, you know, uh, under extreme duress. Like, I suppose going to the match official, like David Goff, like I know Podrick Joyce talked about him as, as you know, the, the best referee in Ireland. Now, I, I, I'm going to disagree with that. I'm not here to, we're not here to bash referees far from it because they're an extremely difficult job. But I, I wouldn't say he's the best referee, but I'd say he's probably the most famous referee in Ireland because of the profile that he's probably built for himself. You know, on social media and stuff like that as well, and it's 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 a sort of a dicey one as a referee. You know, to be so public, Ryan. You know, you're, you're out there, you're so public. Um, you know, you're very vocal about things. I've had a few discussions with him on social media myself, but a few exchanges with him on on different things. Like, but I think sometimes he's a wee bit card happy. I think sometimes he's a wee bit erratic in his decision making. I thought the free at the end was very debatable. I know everything looks worse from a still image Ryan like but in real time I just thought like where did the free come from there like it just it seemed a bit of a mad call you know <clears throat> well first time in my opinion referees is there should be very little talk about them when you're watching the Absolutely. game we should be talking about Galway and Mayo and the players within that and the different styles or whatever else is bringing the fact that maybe there's a lot of talk about the referee in general doesn't look good now I felt what Goff was doing he, he made a couple of wrong calls and he, in my opinion, was trying to make up for it. That's what it felt like to me, that he kind of realised, geez, that was the wrong call. So then the next time he maybe then give it to the other team. And that can cause frustration because then all of a sudden people watching the game are going, there's another wrong call. Um, so a few of the calls I definitely felt at the time going, ah, oh, Jesus, he definitely got that wrong. Um, one or two, of course, throughout the game, everyone's going to make a mistake. But for golf, for such a high-profile referee, for such a massive game, be straight up here you can't be getting any more than one or two big calls wrong because there's such fine margins at that level between you know between two teams to yeah. get that I think Goff probably Kevin McStay for me could have had a point to come out and say he got a couple of calls wrong there which which threw the momentum in favour of Galway but one thing I must say about McStay is he never looks for excuses and yeah, true. Yeah, I have yeah. to credit him for that he will always just say we weren't good enough on the day and yeah, yeah. Apologies, sorry, it was McStay that said that, wasn't it? It wasn't Joyce. It was McStay that said he was the, the best referee in Ireland, wasn't it? Okay, right. I didn't even know that. But I must say, McStay, he took he took the loss well. And Goff, let's call it speed of speed. There was definitely, there was a number of calls there where if he watches it back, he'll see that he, he got it wrong. Yeah. On social media now, Ledge, like, there's no hiding place for a referee. Like, I remember speaking to Paul Flew. Like, I think Paul's one of the best in Ireland. I'm... I'm I'm going to go on record and say that I think he's definitely up there as one of the best in, in, in the country because I'll tell you why. He's, he's played the game. Paul actually was a really good footballer, played for, for, for down under age teams, minor and under 21 teams, was, a, was an extremely talented player, took up referee in very early. So he's played the game, he understands the game, but he's got a very good way with players. He'll speak to players, he'll call them by name. Ryan, you've probably played under him a few times as well as a ref, but he always says to me, Whenever you wish him all the best for a big game, and he's had some big games recently. It's brilliant to see. He got the Ulster Club final this year as well, and he just talks about Stevie. I just want the game to pass by incident free. I just want it to be incident free, and I just think that's a sign of a real top referee. Whereas I think some other ways, without naming them, I just think they would get a wee buzz at seeing their name associated with a back page headline or something like that. You know, and I just feel as a ref, yes, you know, it's it's. It's 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 a, a, a species that we need more of, of course. No ref, no game. We, we completely understand that. But there is ledge a way of, of sort of probably going about your business, isn't there, as a referee? Like, And it is a difficult job. <laughs> yeah, look, and, and again, our MO here is more so from the coaching element rather than the referee side of it. But, but I, I firstly, I'd agree with Ryan. I, I think there was a certain element of levelling up those last couple of calls. Like, I mean, where, where Galway had the quick free. Look, technically... Technically, he's right to bring it back, but you could have brought it back and, and maybe taken it again from that spot because, like, just a small bit of common sense there. And even the, the, the quick free that Galway hit that Comer had on top of the D, like, they were two really harsh calls, I think, on Galway. And, like, I, I kind of... Part of me was, like, when he when he made a couple of, of decisions then that went for Galway in the last few minutes, I was kind of like, oh, I suppose, you know, you're kind of all right with him balancing it up a bit. But that's dangerous. That's toppy waters when you go into that kind of stuff because... 
like when there's rounds, I mean, you start balancing the books and everyone's looking at it. And you've got two sides going mad at you, you know. Um, look, I, I think a big a big thing is 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 referees' mannerisms and how they react to players and, and talk to players. And you can see, like over the last couple of weeks, I have seen some very um like proactive hands, we'll say, with referees where it's a bit of this or it's a bit of school teacher stuff, you know, where you can see there's a bit of dramatization for effect. Um, like I, I in fairness, I I think off's not too bad. Like it is it is a very difficult role that he, as you say, he has such a high profile and I, I think he will be regarded as one of the best referees in the country. But with that comes a pressure that it's almost such a shock. Anytime he's not kind of foot perfect, it's, oh Jesus, what's, what's that about? You know, so all his decisions get magnified a small bit more. Um, like all in all, I didn't think he, I didn't think he was too bad, but maybe sometimes you're just, are, are you trying to show how much of the rule book, you know, you know, be, like being a little bit, too clever rather than applying common sense to some scenarios. And I think, look, he probably rectified that situation. I, I think I think he probably cost Galway two scores, but I also think he probably gave Galway two scores at the end, you know, with like the free, the last one, the last one with with, 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 with Connor Loftus getting, like, I, I thought I thought John Mara went in really aggressively on that. I didn't think he need to, needed yeah. to go in as aggressively. It was a three on one. He just needed to stand. Connor Loftus cur- curled into a little ball and just accepted the contact. So I think I think it would have been probably been a free either way. But I could have seen it not being a free because Mara was very aggressive with it. So look, all in all, I <laughs> I don't envy referees. It is an extremely yeah. tough gig. But I, I think a couple of calls in that last 10 minutes got a bit haywire, you know? Well, from a coaching perspective, lads, you know, Ryan, like from a coaching perspective, like it is frustrating as a coach when you have, you know, such inconsistencies, you know, that it, the problem is there is a definition of the tackle. There, people forget there is a definition in the GA of a tackle, right? But the referee's interpretation of the definition is completely different with so many different referees. So like Clare played Kerry. So what do you want from Clare, right? You want Clare to come out all fucking guns firing. You want them to come out with aggression. You want hits. You want challenges. It actually adds to the quality of the game. Like It actually adds to the quality of the spectacle. It adds to the flow. People talk about football being dead, but football becomes so passive that it's actually nearly got to the extent now, lads, where it's nearly no contact. But Ryan, like Fergal Kelly blew a lot of early fouls and there weren't, like, for me, there were nearly three-quarter fouls. Like, there weren't actually full fouls. There was clear men diving on balls. There was clear men just putting their bodies on the line. And players and coaches and supporters want that, Ryan. They want that flow to the game. They don't want a whistle going every 10 minutes. And it would be brilliant if, like, you know, even the top coaches, top managers in the country could come into a room with the referees, have open discussions, have chats, you know, look at different clips and say, like, you know, this is what we feel. And I just think everyone would learn from that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I definitely agree, Stephen. I suppose there is the rule book there. So what Dan talked about, where goalie hit the quick free, he was about two yards away from where the spot was. So he brings it back, and the rule book probably does state if they hit a quick free from the wrong spot, it's a throw up. So David Goff was following the rule book. But I just find in rugby, sometimes I'm sure they have a rule book as well, but referees are nearly allowed to interpret it in a way that they get a feeling for the game. So maybe if there's an opponent that's maybe a bit revved up and he's giving the referee a bit of lip, he'll judge that situation and decide, do I need to actually give this guy a, a booking or a yellow card or a sin bin because he's been over the top or do I just need to calm him down and have, have a quiet word? Um, and that's the problem with Gaelic football from one game to the next. We watched two games, one after the other. Fergal Kelly was probably, le- you know, he was pulling everything. Any kind of contact at all within the rulebook, that's a free. While the next game, as Dan mentioned there, that last t- tackle from Big Maher for Galway, he left the hand, he left the hand in, and technically the rule book says the hand must come in and out. But one hundred percent, and Goff was in a good position. But I just felt at that moment in time, he felt that he'd been a wee bit hard on Galway. It was in Salt Hill, etc. He decided I probably am going to favour Galway for this one because yeah. the last well, I went against him. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And listen, look, you know, it is a difficult role, lads. We we, we totally ex- appreciate that and respect that. Like, but I suppose from a coach's point of view, like we just want that level of consistency. But look, man, looking forward, obviously, you know, the, the Talchin Cup is, is kicking off, I think, this weekend, isn't that right? Is this weekend? It's this Sunday. Talchin Cup kicks off this Sunday. So we'll have right. Saturday, Saturday, yeah, we'll have plenty to talk about next week. Like, but looking forward, obviously, you know, to to the Talchin lads. It doesn't really make over overly common sense to see groups of four in the Talchin Cup and three going through, you know, one team getting limited. And with all due respect, like, you know, down we're drawn in a group with Limerick, London, and Offaly. Like, and I don't even think from a supporter's point of view, you're going, wow, like, and you know, you're even thinking I'm just 
hearing reports of a few players are sort of thinking, oh, I know there's been one retirement this week now, McParn or whatever, and a couple of other players talking about the states and stuff. And, you know, it, it, it is probably a sign of the times, lads, the way the, the goodwill of the Talisman is nearly gone already. And, lads, you did call it last year. Like, you sort of thought that it would fizzle out. I think the two semi finals being live on TV last year ended a damp squib down put eight goals past leash and I think that'll probably be the last time those two semi-finals will be in TV like but what's your view on it Ledge? it just seems to be more games for pointless like, yeah pointless. yeah and I know I, I know like during my time and, and Ryan you probably knew a bit about this but players were looking for more games in summer you know but it's probably more meaningful games in summer than anything else like and I, I agree with you that like uh, three teams coming out of a group of four that's, that's six weeks or whatever it is to to, to sort all that out like that that's a long slog and like when you look through all the groups and you look at let's say happy panels or panels who you're thinking are on a good edge so let's say Claire are on a really good flow at the moment they're in a happy place but you look at look at look at look, look at group one Kildare, Leitrim, Longford, Waterford yeah. or Wexford sorry Waterford is it like I mean like Kildare I have no more interest I'd say than this you say down even the same like probably massively disappointed to lose Ulster um, like I know Carlo my, my home county is it's Things aren't fantastic there at the moment. You you have a handful of counties who will be really going after it, but for the most part, I think it might be a bit of a it might be a bit of a drag for players, you know. Whereas maybe if it was an open draw, something like that, or or it was uh, we're probably going back to the qualifier system, <laughs> qualifier system is more. But I, I I just I just think it doesn't rev the engines that much of players because you're back playing a lot of the similar teams you've played for year in, year out for most of your career because most teams tend to be staying or in or around the same division for the most part, you know. So, like so Limerick, 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 Limerick came to Nuri this year and got hammered, absolutely hammered out the game, right? What, what motivation is there for them to come back down to Nuri again a couple of weeks later and get the same result? Like, you know, it, it just, you know what I mean, Ryan? It doesn't, it doesn't really, I don't think it does anything at all, you know? Yeah, it doesn't. And then I suppose if you are a lesser team and you can like Waterford there for instance beat Tipperary in the championship, all right. So that was a that was a massive win for them, first time getting a win in the Munster Championship, and I don't know how long. So you wonder now, does that kick start their season? And are they their first game, for instance, is away to Leitrim? Are they saying, "Well, hold on, a wee second here. This is a game where we're underdogs, but we definitely can we we can get a big win here." And that's that more or less gets their season up and going. So that's the other side of it. You're probably looking at the likes of Limerick, and you're saying. They have no intentions. They're they're fearing got up to Newry, while other counties maybe they can say, well, this is our level, and we weren't going to get promoted in the league that we were in, so we 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 need to try and take a big scalp, and then can we take that into the next game, and so be it, and let's see how we get on. I suppose from their point of view, they just have to finish in the top three, you know, make sure that they're not bottom. But from a from the stronger counties, the likes of maybe a Kildare or Fermanagh or a Down that are so called you know C one then there is an, a few knots in games. But they're the ones that they have to be careful that they don't actually get caught. Like Fermanagh's playing Wicklow, that, that's a tricky game. Then they're away to Carlo. Dan saying Carlo isn't going that well. But if Fermanagh take their eye off the ball and get caught, that could be the one game that just kick kickstarts Carlo's campaign again. So um, yeah. from, from a supporter's point of view, I do feel there's probably a lot of games where you're going, I'm not I'm not interested in watching that. Or, yeah. you know, I'll catch, I'll, catch, I'll catch that competition when it gets to the semi-final stage. Yeah. Let's see even just the, the, what's at stake, lads. Like, there's three teams go through. Like, you know, like, let's be honest. Like, you know, even I'm just using Downs Group as an example. Like, down in Limerick, uh, Offaly in London, like, it's going to be between Limerick and London who doesn't qualify. Like, you know, so like, Offaly and Down will go through. They'll win one game. You have to win one game to go through. It just, it just doesn't really, doesn't do anything for me. And it, it seems to me, lads, that we have a National League, a brilliant product, a brilliant competition. For me, the best competition we have is the National League. And then we're back into like nearly another mini league. You know, we seem to be the only cup competition that has a league. And then, you know, the cup competition is another league. Like, and for me, Ledge, I just think home and away, Halchin Cup, you know, 16 teams in the hat, or whatever it happens to be, you know, it would be, I think it'd be brilliant, you know, and just have just an open draw be brilliant you know and then you could have a uh, Carlo or an Offaly or just for talk's sake a Wicklow who might get the, a favourable draw squeeze their way through to the final big day at Crow Park brilliant but the way it's structured now is like Down and Kildare can't not be in a semi-final or a final like they just simply can't like you know what I mean like it's just it's it's impossible for them to it's nearly impossible for them to lose you know that's that's the thing like you know yeah, look, and 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 Ryan said that that could be dangerous as well. You could take the eye off the ball. Sorry, one second. 
we're getting we're getting the announcements here. Um, that that could be that could be difficult for them to get themselves up for that. I mean, look, you're you're right. Like we have a perfect system in the league. And I know, let's say, as, as a player in a Division Four league, you got judged on that competition. That was where the real judgment came. That was where people yeah. kind of based your, yourself off. I don't think if anyone really, I don't think anyone really looks at the Halton Cup and says one way or the other, that's your judgment place. Like I don't think so. I think it's it's almost seen as this extra little thing that happens, and it's actually keep the players happy. They all get a couple of games out. Sure, what more do you want? I I, I think there. Are, I think it's just crying out for the leagues to be in the summer. It really is. And it just yeah. gets rid of all of this, gets rid of all of this kind of nonsense, really, that we're getting through just to get to the final few. You know, yeah. it's oh look, we could be here for the here for the week talk, yeah. talking about structures, but it just doesn't. It just doesn't. Like I was looking at GA go even at the weekend. Like I, I love watching football. I love watching matches. I'm a very very vanilla to what's <laughs> what's coming up outside, of, like in the in the in the in the Talton Cup, you know. Yeah, well, look, look, looking forward to live Dublin at the weekend to see if Lyth can close the gap. And uh, obviously, Armagh Donegal is, is going to be a coin toss. Like, there's going to be very little between those teams. Might even go the draw again, Ledge. I mean, you had a bit of joy in the draw the last day in, in the athletic oh, rounds. Yeah. But, uh, but no, listen, lads, thanks a million. And we've plenty to chat about uh, next week. And we'll chat this next week. Thanks, man. Thanks, lads.